State Institutes of Energy and the Environment. And I, I want to start off the bat by acknowledging uh, the staff at PSA, but especially Laura Fowler, who's with the Dickinson School of Law, who's really done the, the legwork of organizing this and, and uh, has been working with PSIE and, and the School of Law for the last year, us with a number of initiatives. Um, the Penn State Institutes of Energy and the Environment and the Dickinson School of Law are very pleased to co host the, the speaker today, Professor Dan Kahan. For the last year and a half, we've been really focusing a lot of our effort on trying to find ways to integrate environmental science with law and policy. And we're very thrilled to have Professor Kahan here at Penn State. He served as a Supreme Court clerk for Justice Thurgood Marshall and also a clerk on the D.C. Court of Appeals. He's now the Elizabeth K. Dollar Professor of Law and a Professor of Psychology at Yale Law School. And he's a member of the Cultural Cognition Project, which is an interdisciplinary team of scholars who are using empirical methods to examine the impact of group values on perceptions of risk in science communications. His work has been funded by a number of different agencies, including the National Science Foundation. He's been investigating issues of disagreement around climate change, public reactions to emerging technologies, and conflicting public impressions of scientific consensus. <coughs> His articles in, have appeared in a variety of peer-reviewed journals, including the, the uh, Science Magazine, just had a piece in there very recently, uh, Journal of Risk Research, Judgment and Decision Making, the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies, Nature of Climate Change, and Nature. Here in Pennsylvania and at Penn State, we're grappling with a variety of issues that this work really reflects very strongly on, the cleanup of the Chesapeake Bay, the Marcellus Shale, climate change, and a variety of other critical scientific issues. And the ability of all of us, both physical and social scientists, to communicate information clearly and effectively to a variety of audiences is essential in finding ways forward. We look forward to hearing from, from Professor Kahan today in his talk entitled, The Tragedy of the Scientific Communications Commons. And we have some time at the end for questions. So please help me in welcoming Dan Kahan. Well, thank you very much, um, and it's it's really uh, an honor uh, uh, to be here. Um, I mean, it's really gratifying um, to know that um, an audience like this wants to hear what I want to say, um, because to me, this is the kind of audience uh, that is interested in exactly the sorts of issues that I'm interested in. Um, and I think the Institute on Energy and Environment is a model, really, um, of the way in which we're integrating uh, the science of science communication uh, with the practice of science and, and science informed policy making. Um, of course, I also was really glad to be here because I thought this would be a safe place to be if, in fact, Armageddon broke out today. They hadn't passed the budget and stuff. I was told that you could live off the land and everything else, but <laughs> I guess, I guess I'll, get, I'll be able to go home. I might not go home, actually, because it's a really nice place. Um, so, well, I'm going to talk about uh, the science communication problem, all right? And, and by the science communication problem, uh, I mean to refer to the, the failure of uh, valid, compelling, widely accessible uh, scientific evidence to quiet public controversies about risk or other kinds of policy uh, relevant facts to which that evidence speaks in a very clear and direct way. Um, and obviously, climate change is the, the most conspicuous example of that. Um, but it's not the only uh, instance of the science communication problem. Um, and in fact, the, the work that I uh, do um, with John Gaskell, among other people, uh, had its origins in uh, studies in the 1970s um, when psychologists uh, became interested in the divergence between the public's understanding and expert understandings of the safety of nuclear power. And what explains this gulf in expert and public understandings? And a lot of this arises out of, out of that research. And of course, there are other contemporary instances of this too. I mean, they still have nuclear power to some extent. But the HPV vaccine is another good example. Or to some extent, gun control, I think, should be understood this way. Um, and part of the point I want to make um, is that uh, some of the problems that we're having 
and they're pretty consequential um, in this regard, uh, reflect a, 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 a needless and unfortunate failure uh, to make use of what we know about how people come to know science. Um, we know a lot about decision-relevant science and how to improve the lives of individuals and communities. Um, that's a really important asset, um, but we don't make a commensurate investment um, in using our best understandings of how to deliver uh, that asset to people. Um, and it can be wasted um, for that reason. So I'm going to be kind of making that argument here. Uh, and so I'm going to be kind of making that argument here. Uh, and the three parts, uh, first I I'm going to give you some hypotheses and some evidence about what the, the nature of the science communication uh, problem is. And that this, is a, this is something that needs to be investigated empirically. You can't just guess what the problem is. Um, then I'm going to sum up the interpretation, essentially, of the evidence that I'm presenting to you. And it, it, it's, it's normative and prescriptive significance. That's the tragedy of the, the risk perceptions commons. And, and then, time permitting, I'll tell you what we can do to fix it, although that's usually not that important. It should be an issue with that. But it'll be obvious at that point. Um, so we'll start with, with hypotheses, hypotheses to explain the science communication problem, the failure of this accessible, compelling evidence to quiet really very divisive kinds of, of public controversies about risk and other kinds of, of policy relevant facts. And, and I'm going to give you two, um, and, and I'll introduce them kind of in order. Um, and, and the first one is kind of, I think, the most familiar, called the public irrationality thesis. And, and the idea is that you have conflicts in the public about things like climate change because the public really doesn't fully comprehend the issues. Um, the public doesn't know um, a lot of science. So they have a hard time understanding what the scientists are trying to tell them. And, and they might be easily misled by other people who want them not to understand what the scientists are saying. Um, they also don't tend to think the way that scientists do. Right? Like scientists think in kind of conscious, deliberate, analytical, what, what, what economy calls the slow system, whereas ordinary people form perceptions of risk in, in, a, in a visceral, kind of rapid, intuitive fashion. And as a result, they, they, they tend to, to fixate on more sensational potential sources of danger, right? So the, the, the airplane fuselage on fire sticking out of the, the sky rise and people flying out, that's so much more compelling than the silly polar bear floating around on the ice. Right? So people will overestimate that this more conspicuous risk relative to something that's not nearly as dramatic but maybe even more consequential and people are nodding. But you should nod because it's a perfectly plausible claim. Um, but here's something important. There are more plausible explanations of this and most interesting phenomena than are actually true. Right? And if you, if you don't actually engage in empirical examination to kind of separate out the, the true or the things you, that you have the most reason to be confident in from all the rest, you can kind of drown in a sea of storytelling. Right? And decision science is filled with with mechanisms. If you just kind of treat it as a grab bag, you can pull anything out and make any kind of convincing argument you want, and you can publish it in the New York Times as an op-ed writer or even write books and so forth. But it might not be true, right? So we want to investigate whether this is, I mean, this is, these, these are true mechanisms, but are they the ones of consequence in this context? So one study that my collaborators and I did uh, looked at how uh, the kinds of, of of dispositions that might reflect people's capacity to make sense of science relate to climate change perception risks. Right? And we took a large national sample. And really simple item, we just said how much do you believe climate change, how much risk do you believe climate change poses to human health, safety, or prosperity? It was on a scale of, of, of zero to, to ten. And they said only 5.7, can you believe it? I mean, that must be wrong. I mean, there's not a right or wrong answer. I mean, this is a good item because it'll correlate about 0.9 with anything you ask people relating to climate, like whether the Earth's heating up, whether that's being caused by human activity, 
whether that's causing ice to melt, anything they can understand and understand the valence of, it's going to load pretty heavily on this. And so then you can use this as a kind of an economic indicator, but for what? For exploring variance, really. I, I want to know what kinds of characteristics correlate with, with saying I, I view it as more of a concern in which with less. And I don't really care that much about where the intercept is on a measure like this, so I kind of centered it here at zero, right? But if you have a, a measure that enables you to, to look at the variance, then you can test certain hypotheses about why the, the average member of the, the public would now put at zero here, 5.7, isn't as concerned as he or she should be relative to what the scientific evidence says is the risk posed by climate change. Right? So if you believe in the public rationality thesis, right, you would make a prediction here. If the reason that the average member of the public isn't as concerned about climate change as he or she should be is that that person doesn't really know enough science, right? or, or doesn't have the, the kind of critical reasoning dispositions to make sense of scientific evidence, well, well then you would expect that as the person becomes, as people, become more science literate, right? as they become more adept at the kind of, of reasoning that is the signature of scientific reasoning, right? the slow, deliberate system to reasoning, they ought to become more concerned. Right? So what we did was we, we, we took the large 1,500 person nationally representative sample, and we measured the science literacy. We used the items from the National Science Foundation Indicators are typically used to measure science literacy. Show we're, we're just behind Afghanistan, we're catching up. We, we, we also use numeracy, which is not just how good you are at math, but basically how good you are at reasoning with quantitative information and drawing valid inferences from evidence, basically. And it happens to be a really good indicator of the disposition to use the more conscious, deliberate system to as opposed to the more the, the visceral, heuristic-driven system one kinds of reasoning, right? And, and what we find is that well, with science literacy, at least it kind of goes down. But that, that's science literacy. And we'll look at well, numeracy, too. Also, slightly negative correlation as people become more science written a little bit less concern. Now, the truth is that's, that's not much different from zero, right? I got 1,500 people. It's significant or whatever. But to me, you know, if, if it had been just positive and significant, but only to the same degree, it would have the same significance. Because what I would have expected to see, the evidence most consistent with the public rationality thesis, would have been a pretty strong sloping upward curve. Right? So this is not, this means it's wrong, but it's, it's evidence that's less consistent with that theory, right, than maybe something else going on. Right? So, now we go to, I'm going to come back to this, but I'm going to introduce the second hypothesis here. They call this the cultural cognition thesis. Right? And, and the cultural cognition thesis is that people are going to, to form perceptions of risk and related facts that reflect and reinforce their connection to certain important kinds of affinity groups ones with whom they have shared values and are engaged in important activities in daily life, right? Now, th this is a, 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 a kind of variant or a species of, of in what in psychology is called motivated reasoning. In motivated reasoning, it, it, it refers to a tendency to conform your assessment of information. It could be arguments, it could be the credibility, of people who are presenting information to you. It could even be what you're seeing with your own eyes, right? To some objective that is extrinsic to, you know, some goal external to actually getting the right answer, right? I'm motivated to fit the evidence to something else. And here we're saying, well, it's to some kind of commitment you have to, the, to a group. And in fact, the, the kind of classic study, and this is a, a 1950s study, of they saw a game. And they took undergraduate students and they catch the left. Oh, that was different. They, they, they had them watch a, 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 a tape of a football game 
this would be pathetic Ivy League schools, I'm sorry. But, and they said, look, the, the referee made some, some contentious calls, so watch this and see what you think. Right? And so all the students from Dartmouth, I said, you know, you know he's screwing Dartmouth. You know, he must have been like a Penn alum or something like that. And all the Penn students said, you know, wow, you know, he's really, he must have had it out for us. He was on you know, the payroll of Dartmouth and so forth and so on. Right? And, and this is motivated reasoning, this, the emotional stake they have in experiencing the kind of solidarity with that group is actually influencing what they see. Right? And, and lots of research like that on, on effects like that. Now, of course, what are the motivating groups? In, in the research we do, we assess what we call people's cultural worldviews, really just their preferences about how society or other kinds of groups should be organized along two dimensions, individualism, communitarianism, hierarchy, egalitarianism. Actually, it's pretty ubiquitous in the social sciences. It, it probably is part of our genetic heritage. I think it helped us escape from save two tigers or something like this. But we use it because it's part of the, the Mary Douglas, the cultural theory of risk, said that, that you should expect people's perceptions of risk to reflect and reinforce their connection right, to these kinds of groups. Right? The kinds of people who are share ways of life that are formed by the intersection of, of these ways of organizing their reactions to how society is organized. Right? And, and one of the claims was that the people who are hierarchical, where they believe in a lot of authority based on clear rankings, but also individualistic, right? that, that, that they value individual initiative, they think people should be responsible for securing the conditions of their own flourishing without interference from the state or resistance. They're going to be skeptical about environmental risks, she and Aaron Moldovsky said in a, in a book, Culture and, and Risk. Why? I mean, maybe because they recognize that if people start to accept these claims, that's going to create pressure to restrict commerce, industry, markets. I mean, activities that are important to them, not just materially, but even symbolically. I mean, they, they associate these things with human excellence. Now, people oops, who are more egalitarian and communitarian, on the other hand, they're, they're already kind of morally ambivalent or suspicious of markets, industry, commerce, because they see them as the source of unjust social disparities. So on this theory, she said, you know, those joys are really good of mechanisms. That's what we're interested in. But she said, okay, well, they'll, be, they'll find the claim that these things are more dangerous and congenial. We're talking mainly about nuclear power at the time. Right? And, and we've done stuff with uh, other risks, too. This is where we first were interested in guns. Right? The, 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 the gun has, it's kind of a, a cultural piece of equipment. Right? It, 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 it enables someone to occupy a kind of hierarchical role, especially a man, you know, a father, hunter, provider. And it symbolizes certain kinds of individualistic virtues like self-reliance and courage, right, and, and honor. And so people who have those values, and men in particular, they're going to have a, a certain stake in access to the gun and other people not forming views of it that would have them suffer some kind of stigma. So they don't see guns as dangerous. And in fact, they see controlling weapons, restricting their access to them could be dangerous because they couldn't protect people. Whereas the, the egalitarian communitarians, well, they associate the gun historically. It was used to basically as an instrument for enforcing apartheid. It still resonates with patriarchal values. It, it, it's kind of a gesture of, of distrust for some people, like every person for him or herself. And, and that disposes them on this theory to, to see the gun as more dangerous, to see the gun control not as dangerous, but as efficacious. And, and all kinds of, of theories, correlations like this, but we're interested in mechanisms, right? And, and basically, <laughs> these, these groups are, for the, the, the cultural cognition thesis, what the university affiliations or college affiliations were for the students and they saw a game, right? These are the kinds of connections they're going to have that would be motivating them to make sense of evidence here about these kinds of risks that are important in their group way of life. Right? So here's a, here's a study like this. We looked at, at scientific consensus, right? people's perceptions of scientific consensus. And what we did is we asked them, do you think that these people are knowledgeable and credible experts on these issues, global warming, nuclear power, gun control? And, and they all, well, one of them went to a really good school, the other one pretty good schools. Um, and I'm a, I'm a, 
had been my contract. They had to say those stupid things like that. Um, they're all on the, the faculties of prestigious universities, all members of the National Academy of Sciences, kind of the conventional kind of indicia of somebody who knows what he, I mean, when we use white males, we don't have any compounds. You know, that's it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these groups would take race and gender into account. I'm trying to control for that. But are these people experts? Now, we pick these issues because we know that people with these kinds of outlooks are divided on this. We also have, have information from the National Academy of Sciences, at least what they think expert consensus is on the relevant issues. And we're giving them you know, evidence, really, about what the positions of their groups are. But we have an experimental component, right? Half the people are seeing the, the featured scientist taking a position that says, oh, there's high risk, climate change is, is happening, consensus, or we better do something. The other, the low risk, we actually take these right out of writings of people who have similar credentials, you know, judged by our conventional scientific standards, premature, the computer models, et cetera, et cetera. Similar, uh, deep geologic isolation, nuclear waste, very risky, no, not risky. The concealed carry laws, right? It, it, it's very dangerous to allow people to carry concealed weapons in public, because then they might, they might use it if there's a fight or there's more guns around. No, it actually decreases crime because, well, everybody's on their kind of best behavior. They don't know who's carrying a gun. They're kind of more polite to people and so forth. Kind of, this is a, I know what cultural orientation you have if you have it Because then, of course, you know, whether you see the person as an expert now is very highly conditional on whether the pictured scientist is taking the position that's consistent with the one that predominates in your cultural group, right? So the people who, the egalitarian communitarian is much, much more likely, 72 percentage points more likely to agree. That's an expert in the climate change if the person says that that's a high risk than somebody who's the hierarchical individuals. And you get similar effect sizes with all the others, right? So this is a kind of, this is like they saw a game. I mean, they're being shown evidence here that is relevant to what scientists might believe. Right? But they're actually only crediting it in a kind of selective way. I mean, this is a model. I don't think they're actually going around <coughs> counting scientists. But they're getting information all the time about what scientists believe. Right? And if in fact, they're crediting it when it's consistent with the position that's predominant in their group. And not finding it credible, well, that's some other is prank, or that's not an expert on that, and it's not, then they're going to kind of end up polarized on what scientists believe. They're engaged in bias sampling. Right? And in fact, that's what we found that these groups all believe that the position that is dominant in their group is supported by scientific consensus. Right? None of them is saying, screw the scientists. Right? They're all saying, well, of course, our position is consistent with scientific consensus, which is what you would expect if this is how they're processing the information. And by the way, they're all right about a third of the time. Right? I mean, the group that's right about the climate change, if we're using the, the National Academy of Sciences supports as a benchmark, they're wrong about the deep geologic isolation of the nuclear waste. Right? They're both wrong about gun control. At least the National Academy of Sciences says you really can't have an expert consensus on this because the models they use are just too fragile to allow any kind of confident conclusions. Right? Nevertheless, everybody's convinced there's expert consensus on these things. I don't think one of these groups is better than the other because I don't think one of these groups is a more reliable indicator of what scientific consensus is than the National Academy of Science reports. I just think they're both likely to be picking out the evidence in a way that co confirms that their view, group's view is the one that's consistent with scientific consensus. Now I'll go back to this study, okay? And I've, I've now combined the science literacy and numeracy measures they go here very well on a nice scale and they don't even really load so much with education. So they're measuring something relating to science comprehension. That's distinct, okay? And of course, we look at the cultural worldviews of the subjects. Oh, look how much bigger! You know, that, that's not the point. And what we wanted to do was see what the interaction is. Because you could actually look at this and say, well, that's not necessarily consistent with the public rationality thesis. Right? You might say, if people know a lot of science, if they can make sense of quantitative information, then they're going to go with the data. But if they can't, if they don't understand something, they can't understand it, they go with their gut. And that's what the crap, like, what do people like me believe, right? And then you get this kind of culture effect. But that way of looking at this 
would also generate a testable prediction. I mean, if, if in, in effect the cultural cognition, as I'm describing it, is a heuristic substitute for the, the reliance on science comprehension, then we ought to expect that the hierarchical individuals should become more concerned as they become more science literate, more numerate, and that the gap between the groups, it ought to shrink, right? Because the, the members of these groups who have the highest science comprehension, they ought to at least be, be converging. They're not relying so much on the group association. But here's what we find, that the people who are egalitarian and communitarians, they actually do become slightly more concerned as they become more science literate and numerate. Only slightly, but honestly, if they became any more concerned, they probably would have to be the institution. I mean, they're really already very concerned. They are more concerned about this than they are about terrorism. So there is a ceiling effect here. <laughs> but there's no ceiling effect here unless it's in the other direction. The hierarchical individuals, as they become more science literate and numerate, they become less concerned. And the gap that was already pretty big for these groups, for the low science literacy and low numeracy people, it's just getting bigger, right? So the polarization is increasing as science literacy and numeracy increases. <laughs> That's not what you expect to see with the public rationality thesis. It, 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 it's what you expect to see if cultural cognition is essentially independent of the way in which people are able to make sense of the information. Right? Essentially people are using their ability to make sense of information to find the views that fit what they, they, their group believes. Right? I'll show you a couple experiments. One's published. I'll show you an unpublished experiment on this that we just did. So we asked people to look at the results of a, a mock experiment, right? So here involving skin cream. And you gave skin cream to deal with a rash, right? And you tell people, well, sometimes the, the rash will go away by itself. Sometimes it actually, you know, the skin cream makes it worse. You've got to do an experiment to see what the results are. And here are the results, right? And, and you summarize them in the, you know, the conventional two by two contingency table where you see what the positive and negative results are for the treatment and for the control, right? And, and you all know, well, what do you do? People look at this and they're not very good actually at detecting covariance. They use a kind of confirmatory strategy. They go, oh, 223 got better, only 75 got worse. I guess it's working. And look, only 107 got better in the people who didn't use the skin. It's working, right? But that's a confirmatory strategy. What you want to know is, Right, well, what, what the ratio of the outcomes is. Because if more people who are getting the rash, or getting the, the treatment, are getting worse, then that would disconfirm the theory. And that's what's happening here. Right? The, the people who are getting the skin cream, they're, they're only three times likely to get better. People who did not, they're five times likely to get better. So the people who are getting it aren't likely to get better. They're more likely to get worse than the ones who aren't. And that, this is a, 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 a recognized measure of how good people are at making causal inferences when covariance is at work. Now we had another version of it, same numbers, same, but now it's a gun ban, right? Did the restriction on concealed carry laws make crime go up or crime go down, right? And we manipulate the results, so there's four conditions, right? That, that you either skin cream or gun, and we, depending on what the, the, the heading is on that column, the experiment results properly interpreted as either showing that the rash got better or crime went down, or it's showing that the rash got worse and that crime got worse. Right? And we measure the numeracy, again, of their subjects as a measure of how good they are at making inferences with quantitative information. And we did that too by, by political orientation, using political orientation here. It's a different way to measure that, that motivating group association. I guess the, the conservative Republicans in this diverse sample, they were slightly more, more numerate, but not by much. And in the, the skin rash condition, <laughs> what you're seeing, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a locally weighted regression line on a scatter plot, but essentially the proportion of people who are getting the right answer at the top, it's going up as you get more numerate. But basically, people who are low in numeracy, they're getting exactly the wrong answer. It's one of a really good question. You know, you don't, you, you, it's only two answers. But the people who get it, get it right aren't likely to be guessing. The people who don't know, they're much more likely to get it wrong. Right? So at about the, I guess, the, the 85th percentile of numeracy, people start to get it right consistently. Right? 
No, that's in the skin rash. Here's in guns, right? And, and the people who are liberal Democrats by our measure, they're, they're getting it right when it shows that crime is decreasing, but not when it shows that crime is increasing. And, and similarly, people who consider Republicans are getting it right when it shows that crime is increasing, but they're no better than the low numeracy counterparts when it shows that the crime is decreasing, right? And, and you can fit a model to this. These are simulated results, but basically, you know, I, I would predict that somebody who's low in numeracy, right, the, the skin rash conditions, doesn't make much difference what, what their political orientation is. Doesn't make much difference if they're high numeracy, eight correct, you know, if, if, what, their, if, if, what their political ideology is. But now if you go down here, right, huge discrepancies in how likely you are to get it right. And there's polarization among the low numeracy groups too, but it's more compact, right? And what you see is that the gaps between the subjects who have the different political outlooks in the gun conditions at low level of numeracy, they're not nearly as, as divided. The average 25% decrease in percentage points of getting it right if it was the, the answer you didn't like relative to somebody who did like the answer. Whereas among the, the high numeracy groups, 45 percentage point difference. So they're much more polarized. And the difference is that the people who are high in numeracy, they're more reliably noticing when the evidence is consistent with their, with their political outlook. Right? But when it isn't, they're either defaulting to the heuristic view or they're rationalizing their way out of it. And could do this with cultural outlooks, by the way. But if that's what's happening in the world, you will see right? more polarization conditional on higher levels of, of science comprehension. Right? Uh, that's the hypothesis in there in the evidence. And on the tragedy of the risk perception problems, you see. <laughs> if you see this, the problem here is not too little rationality. In a sense, it's, it's too much. Right? People are too good at picking out of information what really matters for their life. It doesn't have any impact on you, what mistake, what you believe about climate change. It, it's not going to affect the policy. Any, any mistake you make based on the science, what you do as a consumer, what you do as a voter, what you do as somebody as a public advocate, it's not going to actually have an impact. And so it won't affect the risk that you or anybody else you care about faces. But given what climate change has come to signify about what kind of person you are, you make a mistake about that relative to your group, that could have very bad consequences. I'm not going to go back to Yale and march around and even attend your resign that says climate change is a, is a hoax. I, and if I'm somebody who employed the barber in the, the fourth district of South Carolina where they had a very conservative congressman, Bob Inglis, who got knocked out by a Tea Party candidate because he said he was concerned about climate change, not a good idea. And the guy comes in for a shave to say, why don't you sign my polar bear petition? I'll get out of a job as quickly as Bob Inglis was. And, you know, under those conditions where it makes a big difference to form the view that's identity congruent and doesn't really make any difference if you get the science wrong, you know, I, I would think rational people are going to tend to form ways of engaging the information that connect them to the group. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it. <laughs> but if you are better at numeracy and, and science comprehension, well then probably you can do a better job at finding more evidence or rational, rationalizing away some that the other people couldn't. And so you get an even bigger effect. Right? Now, I don't more time now, but <laughs> I know you want me to solve the problem. And in particular, you want me to tell you, oh, what do you do about climate change? But I'm not going to do that, actually. Because for one thing, I, not, I don't have any doubt that you'll ask me, and I'll have some things to say about it, you know, involving ways in which you can disentangle, essentially, the, 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 the identity state that somebody has in the fact, right? so that, that they won't have the incentive to form views their identity compatible that are at odds with science. But I'm worried that if I answer that question, you won't ask me an even more important question, which is, how did this happen? Because this is not normal. It's pathological, both in the sense of being really bad, because even though it's in the interest of everybody to do this, if they all do it at once, they're less likely to converge on the best available evidence that could affect all of them, right? Which won't change their incentives at all, all the same, right? But it's also pathological and being very rare, right? That's normal, right? The number of issues where you have this kind of cultural conflict and it gets worse as people get more science literate or numerate relative to the ones where that doesn't happen, right, tiny. 
I mean, we, we're not fighting, at least in the United States, about pasteurized milk or whether the, uh, the cell phones give us brain cancer. There was no big controversy in 2010 when Congress passed the formaldehyde standards for composite wood product act. Remember that one? Right, right, right. No, no controversy about it. It's good. Good legislation because FEMA, everybody died in their FEMA, FEMA huts, right? And, and how does this happen? You know, this is how it happens. These same, these same mechanisms I've been describing are responsible for that. Here's, here, this no ace in verba, that's the motto of the Royal Society. The, don't take anybody's word for it. And it's kind of inspiring, but it's also ridiculous, right? Like, don't tell me what Newton said about gravity, I'm going to do my own calculation. You know, forget that Einstein business, I'm putting my own telescope at the sun to see what the bends like, like this, and, you know, forget the high... Yeah, you're smart, so 500 years from now, you're up to this month's nature. That's 500 years out of date, right? You have to accept just to live, and not mention live well much more as known by science than you can possibly understand or verify for yourself. And the way you do it is by being an expert on something else. And knowing who knows what they're talking about, right? And figuring out what is collectively known. You don't have to be, have an MD to know you go to the doctor and take the, the erythromycin when you got a sore throat. Even though there's a 50% chance you'll think it kills virus. It doesn't matter. You know who knows what they're talking about. And people are able to do that most effectively inside of the groups of people who have views like theirs. Because they can they, they get along with them better, they'll squabble, they can read them better, they know who really knows what they're talking about, who's bullshitting and so forth. So they naturally do that. And guess what? All of the groups, <laughs> they're amply stocked with people who have science knowledge. And they have processes for transmitting who knows what about what. They're all going to get the message about the skin cream, don't worry. It's not going to be that the low numeracy people have acne or anything like this. The high numeracy people will, will tell them, right? And so they end up converging most of the time, right? This is their science communication environment. And it works really well for them, right? Except when an issue on which there is scientific evidence becomes entangled with a cultural identity in some way. and becomes a symbol of who you are and you're standing in the group. At which point you're going to have this kind of stake in forming the group congruent belief that's going to dominate what your, your interest is in forming the correct view, right? But that's not inevitable. How does that happen? You see, the tragedy of the, of the, the risk perception comments, it's not caused by stupid people. <laughs> It's the science communication environment, stupid, right? Something is happening that gets into the, the channels by which people form their understandings of the, these decision-relevant science that links them to these identities. The science of science communication is what we should use to protect the science communication environment. We should understand why this happens, because it's not inevitable, and try to do something. I have five minutes left to try to just one example of this. Right, tale of two vaccines, the HPV vaccine. You know the HPV vaccine, right? It recommended as a, a sexually transmitted disease, very prevalent, causes cervical cancer. Huge controversy about it. And, and proposals to make it part of the mandatory schedule of vaccinations. Every state defeated, except one, Virginia, because it's a really good place for it, to grow it. Merck, the company, gave them a million dollars to open it. Right. Ah, look at how come there was no controversy about the H1N1 flu? Well, there was a controversy. They ran, everybody wanted to get in front of like trampled old ladies and the, and the, and the school children. Right? And you go, oh, that's because this is filled with those kinds of controversial group-related meetings with pre premarital sex and interfering with parental autonomy. That's right. <laughs> but there was nothing inevitable about that. And forget the stupid H1N1 vaccine. The comparison case is the H. BV vaccine, hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is a sexually transmitted disease. That's the main mode of transmission. It causes liver cancer, it kills more people than HPV. When the CDC recommended it, there was no controversy. Instead, states almost uniformly, not quite uniformly, but almost uniformly added it to their schedules of the mandatory school vaccinations. During the years in which the HPV vaccine battle was roiling, 90%, over 90% coverage, year in and year out, on the HPV vaccine. Why? Why did it not have that same meaning, right? <laughs> you only have 30% coverage on the HPV 
vaccine. Two reasons having to do with the way the vaccine was introduced. One was the decision by the manufacturer where to fast track it, and it could only be fast tracked for, for females because only females had the serious disease of cancer that would justify fast tracking it. The other was a campaign that Merck sponsored to get state legislatures to enact the mandates. Right? <laughs> when they do that, you create a public issue. You know, people saying, hey, your daughter, you know, the one who's going to have sex next year in the swing, if she needs to get a shot for STD or she can't come to school. And that's what people are learning about this kind of issue. It's suffused with the signals that this is a controversial issue. Neither of these decisions was necessary. If they hadn't fast-tracked it, it would have been approved for boys and girls, less, less jarring, in just a few years, three years later, maybe faster, right? If they hadn't pushed for the mandates, it would have been available universally, immediately, through insurance and other kinds of programs. And almost shortly, this process of adding it to the schedules would have occurred. This is done not by legislatures, but by public health administrators operating outside the scope of politics. It can't happen now because it's such a controversial issue. That wouldn't have been so good for Merck because it was competing with Smith Glaxo Klein to get its HPV vaccine into the market before Smith Glaxo Klein put. And it wanted to lock up all these contracts with these schools. Right? But it would have been a lot better for the US public because then instead of learning about the HPV vaccine from the news media as a politically contentious issue, people would have learned about it from their pediatricians. They trust their pediatricians. That's why they picked them. And their pediatricians were telling you to get the HPV vaccine. They said, okay, you're just telling me a story. They said, don't tell me stories, give me evidence. Here's some evidence. We did a study on the HPV vaccine as this was going on. Right? And we found that it, we created some culturally identifiable advocates. People would, people would look at these people and they would, they would attribute these values to them. Well, what we found, these public health experts, we would say, people would kind of polarize a little bit on either cultural predispositions, but mainly if you show somebody that that has the same cultural orientation as the subject, they're going to go with that person. Even if the person was telling them the opposite of what their predisposition was. You get polarization only when they see that there's a fight between their guy and somebody else taking these kinds of positions. Merck created that world for the HPV vaccine. In fact, they created it worse than that because they, they tried to head it off. They got Governor Perry, do you remember this? To issue the executive order. <laughs> Because, of course, he looks like that guy in the upper left-hand corner, you know. But he's governor, oops. So everybody finds out about it. And once you find out about it, not only does the constituency they were hoping would be, be, be mollified rebel, so does the, the group that was a natural constituency, which now sees corporations interfering, you see, with democracy. Now, this is not 2020 hindsight. People saw this happening at the time, right? <laughs> In the, in the public health world, they said, don't do this, right? And it wasn't that their arguments were ignored or rejected. They weren't considered. There's no process in the regulatory regime that approves this important kind of asset, decision-relevant science, for thinking what the science communication impact is, right? <laughs> this could happen with nanotechnology, right? Nanotechnology, normal, climate change, pathological. Right? John and I did a study, we showed that it's not too hard to get these groups to polarize, you know. It, it certainly won't be too hard if, the, if you're an environmental group that they think ahead. You know, maybe climate change will be solved. Let's have a nano-free zone t-shirt contest. Now you can even know what it is. Get out ahead of the issue. Right? You should be trying to forecast these things. You, you just sit there and do nothing. What happens? You see, the science communication environment is a public good, just like the natural environment is. No one person can, can do it. It has to be public provisioning. We have, we have an executive order that says every agency action has to be considered for cost-benefit analysis. Okay, that's all right. We have some people doing that. How come there's not an executive order? We don't even need Boehner to agree to it. That would have science, the science communication impact assessment for things like HPV or nanotechnology or synthetic biology, right? But there are other actors who have to contribute to this public good too, right? Like universities, they have to, to make it part of their program to integrate the people who are doing the science of science communication with the people who study science and, and, and are learning about uh, science-informed policy making. We have models of it, including one right here, but we need more of this, right? We need to have this in, in civic, 
civil society too. And actually, the National Academy of Sciences is making a big deal of this, right? Leading the way. Science Magazine, they did this publish an issue on communication in science, right? There has to be this attention to creating. Well, it's creating what? A new, a new kind of political science, I want to say. Because quickly, the, 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 this problem is not something just <laughs> unfortunate. It's intrinsic to the kind of political order we have, right? <laughs> Karl Popper says that the, you only have science in a liberal society it, where there's no institution that can certify what has to be believed. But then, only then, is the path open for a science to progress without kind of bureaucratic interference or error. But only then do people cultivate the habits of mind and the practices of collective engagement that fuel the conjecture and reputation that's the engine of science, right? But you see, you learn so much, so much more than anybody could possibly know. Who's going to certify what's known? You know, now somebody's got to certify it, but there can't be any authoritative certifier because that would be inconsistent with the open society. Well, there's multiple certifiers, a plurality of them. But conflicts among them are inevitable, almost just by accident and misadventure, not, not to mention strategic behavior, right? So we've got a problem in the liberal republic of science, but there are no inevitable historical forces or you know, internal contradictions in popper world. There are problems, problems to be solved by using reason and by using science. We need to have a science that's fitted to the unique challenges that we face. Right? Tocqueville talked about the need for a new political science in a world that's held quite new, the advent of the democratic society. We need a new science for a world that's quite new. The liberal democratic regimes that are pluralistic enough in their cultures to become the great engines of collective knowledge, right? but have a challenge ahead of them of making it possible for the people who have these diverse values to recognize what it is that they collectively no. Right? And if you don't do it, then the value, the value of having the knowledge and the experience of living in a liberal tolerant society gets vitiated. Right? So we need a new democratic political science, a science communication, right? so that people aren't forced to choose between being who they are and, and knowing what's collectively known. Okay? I've got 21 minutes. No, no more time. I, can't, I mean, I can't tell you about this last great experiment, which you can't even see anyway. But uh, human subject didn't need to prove it. It's a lovely cat. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any time left for questions? Okay. There is time for questions. Right, so if I understand your message, and I'm a new professor here at Penn State, you're telling me that I should really just drop my science and find a thousand new Facebook friends in order to convince them that the science behind climate change. I mean, change you see, here's the one thing. One thing I want to convince you is that like doing valid science and communicating it are different. And one of the ways I did it was by obviously giving you completely the wrong idea about what my science. <laughs> this is valid. I didn't communicate it very well because. The point isn't for anybody to stop doing science, but it is for people to realize that doing valid science and communicating it are different. If people who are doing science are doing it, that's what they do. Um, if they want to communicate it, if they're suited for it, they should. The mistake, though, is to, to, to conflate the task of being a scientist with being a communicator, right? I, I didn't see Cabrera, when he hit his home run, yesterday with the, the, doing the play-by-play -play as he rounded the bit. So Tim McCarver actually manages to do... This is going over the head of him. But, but <laughs> Carl Sagan, real, Richard Feynman, I don't know how he was a great communicator, but, but you see, the, the, there's a separate function. And science communication isn't only one thing either. Yes, you need to be able to communicate the substance of science to people who are going to make science informed policy decisions. You need to explain the, the risks and benefits of somebody trying to make a decision about a medical procedure, right? But that, those aren't the same things you need to know in order to secure a, 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 a clean science communication environment, right? It's not one size fits all. So all I'm saying is we need to have 
that kind of, of national science communication intelligence built in. Just have a brainstem right now. And it has to be something that all different institutions contribute to. And if you're doing stuff at a university teaching the science, there's not just one model. I don't know what the, what the right way to do it is. But thank goodness there are lots of universities trying different things. And universities should push the different departments together so that there is that kind of convergence. The thing that I think you're most in a position, not knowing anything else about you, but to contribute to is to say, my university must be part of the project to make this new political science happen. I have a question about um, the role of subgroups out here uh, over in the back of the left. Um, the role of subgroups that might not conform to your, to your model. So as I understand it, there are, for example, groups of conservatives who do, for example, believe in climate change. I might have missed this in your talk, but I'm just wondering how do you explain that? Is there a significance to that in terms of kind of where your prescriptions for for what can or should happen? Well, yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a, a a measurement kind of response to this, but also a practical kind of response to it. Um, one of the reasons we like to use the culture measures is they're a lot more discerning than the political measures. Um, if I show you the average hierarchical individualist and the average egalitarian communitarian, they're both independents who kind of lean in a certain direction, right? If, if you push them. They're not watching Bill O'Reilly or Rachel Maddow, they're watching America's Funniest Pet Videos. Right? And for the most part, they don't know. If you ask them about the, the budgets, you may probably are confused, right? But this is penetrated down to that level. Right? And even now, within those groups, I'm not, the variance isn't, you know, I'm not explaining 100% of the, of the variance, right? But I'm saying I'm explaining enough of consequence. And by the way, you see I have the two by two, and those, the conflicts tend to be diagonal. And I could show you ones where it's the, the egalitarian individualists and the hierarchical communitarians are the ones who are disputing. But my theory is that if you've got that kind of deep level of conflict, it's going to create a lot of confusion and pollution in the science communication environment. But there'll still be, you know, some people getting the message one way or the other because, you know, and for one thing, I'd like to have better measures even of what these things, these things are and explain more the variance. But I also might like to explain why it is that some people who have this kind of disposition aren't that way. You know, do they have some kind of critical reasoning disposition or what have you? But another thing is that they're a resource. Because the thing that they need information, pe what people are confused on is not the science. They don't know more about biology, that's why they think pasteurized milk is okay, than they do about climate science. They're just surrounded by information that assures them that the people they know, who know what's going on, say, do this. Right? And there are people like that out there in their community. If you go to a place like Florida, you can't run for Congress, not a party, it's not the idea, to say, oh, I'm, uh, I'm worried about climate change. But the Tea Party governor in the state and the state legislature pass a law saying, in 2011, time for everybody to update their comprehensive land use plans because we want to make sure that we're appropriately protected in all of the ways of life here in Florida against the impacts of weather, climate, sea level. Well, but you see, they had a bad climate way before climate change. When Ponce de Leon got there, it, it was a big swamp. He didn't find the, the fountain of youth. But he built Disneyland on that swamp, right? And, and now he's got orange. It's amazing. But they keep having to repel. The, and they're used to that. I can find materials from the 1960s that talk about safe saltwater intrusion. And they've got land-grant universities there set up for that. And they talk to them and they believe them. And when they go to have these kinds of discussions, maybe they're members of these kinds of groups on climate change, but they're just property owners, you know? Or the insurance guy is saying that, or the utility company, and so forth. And what I want to do, you see, is populate their environment with the evidence of normality, you know? There's still plenty of issues of policy to talk about, but all of these people are, are orienting themselves with respect to the science in the right way, and even the IPCC science. Right? They, say, they say reopen the approval process for the turkey 
point, the power, nuclear power plant that for the power the light has because their sea level rise projections weren't right. They built it on top of a concrete platform. It's not high enough. And, and so what, what do you mean? Well, there's better stuff, better data. It's right here. It's the IPCC report. Hey, that's the IPCC report. Maybe you are worried about climate, but nothing to do with climate change. We're worried about the, you know, no, I don't care. I just want to have people engaging the science in the way that they should. And I want to show people the resource of people that are like them, right? Don't show them more cars on the water. You've seen that. Don't show them a graph. Show them. Show them that people like them are engaging this in a way that vouches for the, the, the validity and the importance of this decision relevant science. So, we have time for one more question if there is one in the audience. <laughs> we have time for 10 to answer that. really quick. She's got the mic here. I'm going to give you two, two quick answers. Okay. The one question. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, hi. I'm Karen Scott from Newcastle University in the UK, and uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. I'd just like to ask, when the science is uncertain and when scientists themselves disagree, yeah. what do you advise people to do? Well, <laughs> the first thing I advise people to do is never to like mislead anybody. Because um, first of all, it's not appropriate, you know, and. and I, I, I never to simplify either. I mean, people, people, most people aren't really paying that attention to the level of the content and so forth. But if scientists are uncertain, then that, that's something that people should know. But it's also, I think, important, I mean, this is a science communication failure. The, the way in which uncertainty is part of the learning process for climate change hasn't been handled appropriately, right? They're not doing experiments with the climate modeling. Right? They know the mechanisms. They're trying to model a dynamic system because they don't know how all these complicated parts fit together. And you do that iteratively. You start out with a set of assumptions and you have certain parameters. And then you get some evidence, right? And you go, hmm, well, we weren't right, but if we readjust this parameter, right, then we can, now let's do it again. And iteratively, you get better and better. The, the idea that you were wrong to begin with was actually anticipated. And you hoped if you had a good model, you would learn something from that. And so it was a mistake to say to people that the confidence intervals on the IPCCs of first assessments were of some kind of talismanic significance. <laughs> that the kind of the, 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 you know, the magnal line of the climate change defense. No, that's not right. What exactly did you do? I mean, it's hard to say, but, but you, can't, you, can't, you can't do well if you try to simplify, especially if you know somebody else is going to point out to people that that's not the, the, way, it, the way it works. So, I mean, that's not really a good answer, except that I think people are mature enough to understand, you know, that science learns in an in ongoing process. Dan, I think I'm, the last question, thank you for coming to Penn State. Thank you. Um, so, I teach journalism, and a sad, sadly large, portion of my students are, if not innumerate, very afraid of anything that requires them to evaluate numbers. And I worry that they might themselves choose experts based on their own uh, cultural, region, identities. Um, would you suggest that they find four experts every time from each of those well, regions? Or I would you suggest they become numerate? Here's one thing I would, I would suggest, though, is that they make their task evident. They, make their, they build into their, their professional practices evidence-based procedures. Because, I mean, it's actually quite remarkable how many professions are out there that are in the business of transmitting evidence, creating evidence and transmitting it, that never actually see whether their own ways of doing it are valid with evidence, right? Like, I, should, I said to, to my colleagues, maybe we should validate our gradient. Or something. They're like, shoot me or something like this, right? But how do we know that? And it turns out, I think medicine gets this. You know, they're constantly evaluating whether their own procedures are all right. But journal, science journalists, and the point isn't that they're stupid. The point is that they're super smart and they, they've got practical experience. They themselves have arguments about exactly what the norms would be. And when you said, should they talk to four experts? 
Well, one of the arguments they have is, if we're talking, it means kind of hedonistic. Give both sides. Well, wait a minute, if you're getting both sides, you're actually kind of misleading people about exactly, well, then what should you do? You know, because it's, it's not clear. The, the answers on both sides are plausible, and you've got to investigate them. And maybe there's a way to give people enough information about a controversy so they can understand it without having cues in the, the article that mislead them about what the, 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 the weight of the opinion is, right? So I'd say that. But I'd also say this, that it's not really, I mean, numeracy and numbers are not the point. It's critical reasoning. You know, and, and the science literacy me measures are horrible. They're horrible in part because they deal, you know, things like does antibiotics kill a, a virus or a bacteria and so forth and so on. It's just not bits of knowledge or even, you know, method. You always said this. It's a way of thinking, right? And all professionals have to have it. So that's another thing we should be having as we improve the, the capacity of our society to be, to, as we improve the liberal republic of science, the professions need to have people engage in critical reasoning. I think if reporters, you know, looked at studies and they just thought, well, you know, why is this valid? You know, what what was the what's the 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 inference that's being drawn here? Why was this the way to figure it out? First of all, that's what I want to know when I hear the story. But I think if they did that, they would actually leave some stories aside. They would sometimes discover that there are invalid things, like the silly studies that show that you could predict people would get divorced by watching them for 15 minutes, and so forth. It was all retrodiction, right? The person was fitting a model. That was discovered by a science journalist. Now, I'm not saying science journalists should be the ones figuring all this thing out, but they ought to be thinking, if they're going to be a science journalist, they have to be able to evaluate the, the, the inference that from observation, the theory that was driving things. And the point is, they can do it. It might take a lot of time, right? Like I tell law students, you can't understand it, you have to. It might take a long time. If they say, I just can't understand it, then it's like in the movie Patton, where you think perhaps that guy is like slapping it. No, did something. No, they can. You can understand anything. It just might take a while. Well, on that great note, so, so thank you very much, Dan.